Hi, this is Ren. This is Casey. And this is All Walks of Film. And television. So, get ready, have your cap lock set on, because I'm about to say some shit about Black Mirror. And I do mean shit, like shade. Okay. And, and that makes me sad, because I think Black Mirror is definitely one of the all-time best television programs ever made. Yeah, I would totally agree with you on that. I mean, like, my two least favorite ep- There's about an episode a season I don't like as much as the rest of the episodes, and I still consider those five-star episodes. Do you know what I mean? Like, I still think they're great quality, they're just not my taste. Yeah. You know, like, objectively, I don't really have a problem with them, because it's a freaking amazing show. Um, any sci-fi show that has to repeatedly apologize for accidentally telling a truth about the world <laughs> is doing something really, really intelligent and correct. Like, I just think that that is super phenomenal, how this is a thing that just keeps happening. Like, um, there was obviously the UK Prime Minister, who they did find out, fucked a pig. Allegedly. It, it fucking happened. That was hysterical. They apologized for predicting Trump, which I don't personally really read the, the, um, that particular episode that way, but, you know, that's, the is an interesting thing that they felt they had to apologize for that. It's not like they voted for Trump, whatever. Um, and then, more recently, Nosedive kind of became a truth. Um, China is releasing a program that is a personal credit score kind of a thing where it judges your daily interactions and how you live and like how much you make and whether you're responsible and all that stuff. I mean, we already have, you know, credit scores that kind of do that thing, but it's sort of taking it up a notch like it is in Nosedive, where you're basically an Uber driver 24-7. You know, that's really interesting how this keeps happening and I do think it's one of the most intelligent shows and I think it does say a lot about the human condition a lot about society a lot of things that we have a hard time hearing that said the first episode of season four USS Callister is now on my shit list and I hate that I really hate that because I thought this was one of the most enjoyable episodes that are really committed to the, you know, sci-fi theme. It had, like, that real genuine feeling. It made a lot of funny jokes. They even have parsecs as a unit of distance. Like, come on! You, you gotta love it! There's so many, like, really cute wink and a nod, you know. Oh, uh, yeah, it's really fun. And um, I hate that I don't know her name, but the chick from How I Met Your Mother who plays the mother in, in the final season, uh, does a phenomenal job in this episode because she's given a much bigger range to work with than she was on that program. Her name is Kristen Malati. That's it. She's fantastic. And she is like a big Broadway actress. So I'm shocked that she's doing this well in film simply because acting in theater and acting in film are just two different fields, essentially. So I'm surprised to see like how well she's doing on a smaller screen. Um, but you can't get around what this episode is about. And this episode is about Gamergate. So we kind of have to talk about it. Yeah, so if you go back to when this channel practically started, we had some comments to make about it. Um, but but we tried to be a lot more fair than any of the media was being about it because like the media when covering this issue was incredibly biased and I mean that's the nature of media in general but especially pop culture media right but um, I, I think especially since we've shifted to 24-hour news networks I Media has shifted more towards, you know, specific lines of thought instead of, uh, you know, trying to 
at least attempt to maintain a balanced approach. I know Fox News' whole thing is fair and balanced, but <laughs> and MSNBC is just liberal Fox News. And then CNN takes that balanced idea to a flaw where they're like, oh, we're going to get two people on radically opposed sides, let them talk it out, and then just be like, well... <laughs> Whatever. There's clearly no right or wrong here. It's just a matter of opinion. But getting into this episode, I was kind of holding my breath through a lot of the episode because this was clearly about the boogeyman of the male gamer. And I was trying not to judge it too harshly at first because this is clearly, you know, the boogeyman gamer who is, you know, a white, cisgender, heterosexual male who spends all his time gaming. He's really kind of creepy and standoffish, and he's just like this nerdy guy who collects his shit and is obsessed with his action figures, and he lives in his little fantasy world, and he's vindictive, and he's misogynistic. I was trying to reserve some judgment because that guy exists 100%. Talking about people who are like that, I don't think is inherently wrong. So I was kind of like, okay, this could go anywhere. This could be a thing of like, well, that's not what gamers are. This could be a thing of like, the gaming community should shun people like that. It could go to even a thing of like, oh, we had this assumption that that's what he was like because he was a gamer, but that's not really true. I didn't really think it would go there, but like, there are possibilities. Right. I was trying not to like, oh, fuck this, we're talking about Gamergate. And then the last two minutes happened, where, uh, major spoiler alert, so watch the episode, because regardless of my feelings, definitely support this show, definitely watch the episode, agree with it, don't agree with it, like it, don't like it. This is really, really phenomenal content that deserves your support and your views, and it will make your life better. Definitely watch it. But at the very end, the characters get out of his personal bubble... Which I thought, like, that whole setup was going to imply that, like, this is a one example. You know, he's kind of shut off from the world. He's isolated from the internet. This is talking about this one guy, not the community of gamers. Until it was. Because they get out of his computer system onto the internet. And the very first person that they talk to is like, oh, are you going to blow me or what? And it's that exact same fucking boogeyman of the misogynistic male gamer who sees a pretty girl online and it's just like, oh yeah, I want to fuck your face. And that is our entire exposure to the gaming community in this episode, besides the one protagonist female gamer. Kind of. Kind of. And... This whole thing of, like, women can't play MMOs online because they get so much harassment. I'm not saying you can't talk about that. Because any form of harassment or sexual harassment and especially, like, hostility in a public online gaming system or even any community in general. Especially in a nerdy community, I really think needs to be called out. In, like, a political community, in an ideological community, in a nerdy community, we need to call out these fuckers who are toxic. I don't have a problem with that. But when you expand it to, this is what male gamers are, that's when I have a fucking problem with it. This is kind of the exact wrong way of doing Get Out, I think. Because, like, Get Out was talking... It's kind of a similar setup. But it's very clearly attacking the racist institutions, not the racist individuals. It is not trying to paint a picture of white people are all racist because all the white racist assholes are all a part of this one institution in the context of the movie, which is why in the outside world there's no white people. You know, outside of this house, outside of the people who are, you know, buying into this, you know, physical auction. Which is why I don't think, like, get out as racist against white people. You're attacking the institution. You're attacking the system. Not saying individual white people are all racist because they're white. Very different sentiment. This show was definitely trying to leave as its final message. The thing you need to take away from this episode is male gamers are all shitty misogynistic assholes who are secretly vindictive and are just stupid losers in real life. Fuck that. 
No. Y y no. Mm -mm. I don't buy that. I don't believe that. I know plenty of male gamers. I know plenty of female gamers who know male gamers. I know I've never experienced sexual harassment in the gaming community. Thankfully, I'm very lucky in that respect. A lot of my female gaming friends haven't. We're very lucky in that respect. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen or that it doesn't happen often or that it's okay when it does happen at all. We need to call that out. We need to call it out publicly. But you can't paint this brush of male gamers are all shitty misogynistic assholes and we need to lock them up in their own Star Wars spaceship and let them like stew around in their own vitriol. Yeah, I, I mean, one thing that I noticed uh, when I started doing research about like this toxic masculinity of, you know, male gamers and stuff is I, I realized that most of the cases were about males under the age of 18. And I kind of get it to a certain extent where, yeah, when kids are growing up, they are told not to do something. And then it becomes a game. And so that type of toxic gamer does exist. And quite frankly, I believe a lot of them are either in a arrested state of development or, you know, are kids themselves. Now, this doesn't encompass most gamers. This is a small, isolated, um, you know, I, 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 I'm not even going to say small. Because I, I haven't done the research to, like, actually pool from, like, you know, how many gamers, you know, talk talk stuff. But, like, it, I mean, it's with anything that people are passionate about, you're going to get shit talk. But, like, at the same time, a lot of shit talk, while the context of, like, what people are saying might seem one way... Oftentimes, it's not that. It's just, you know, people talking crap. You know, it's... It's, it's, it's like when people do in sports, though. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the way the competitive people who are shitheads talk to one another. Right. And it isn't really related to gender because women do the same shit. We just don't see it a lot in and media. And male gamers also do it to other male gamers. Yeah. I mean, you know, like... Yeah. But, so. but we did see that in the show. He's mistreating you know, the female characters in his game and the male characters in his game the same way. Well, I did appreciate that. Like, it wasn't specifically a, you know, he is being a creepy sexist asshole to women only thing. I did appreciate that, but like... And I did like the fact that the episode was trying to call out that kind of gamer, but it's as soon as you roll that ending that I'm just like, oh, wow, fuck you. Yeah, I also appreciated the fact that at least the episode tried to get on the fact that, like, he was creating this world, um, you know, as a sort of catharsis for how he was being treated in the real world because people were rejecting him. And then, you know, in this make-believe world, he was important. And, you know, it... it the show obviously sets up that this isn't just make-believe. This is sort of its own reality, um, you know, which makes it a lot more disturbing. Now, I will say when it comes to artists and people that are, like, struggling and having a hard time, it is important to, uh, you know, vent your anger in, you know, artistic means. And so, like, outside of the context of... What the episode is, you know, illustrating with the whole Gamergate thing and stuff. I, I can understand, um, you know, kind of what they're getting at. But, like, I do see something problematic about um, sort of demonizing catharsis. Because I think that um, creating an outlet um, for aggression, especially when it's, like, make-believe. You know, obviously, um, you know, when some people... Um, you know, fantasize it gets brutal, but uh, I think that it's important to know that uh, there is a distinction. Right, and one thing I did really appreciate in this episode is they weren't trying to, you know, highlight this fallacious cor correlation between, you know, male gamers who are violent and misogynist in games are also that way in real life. Mm -hmm. Like, I do appreciate that, but the episode was very 
it was definitely trying to talk about the way that gamers communicate with other gamers, not the way that gamers communicate in, like, playing their one-person game on a PlayStation. They're talking very specifically about the way that gamers communicate with other real gamers who are real people. But the confusing thing I was... Like that. That, I think that that was a good move, because even though in the context of the episode it wasn't connected to the internet and it wasn't an MMO, it was clearly supposed to you know, talk about the way that gamers talk to each other when they have that an- anonymity and they have, like, their headsets on and they're just, like, talking shit to other gamers and they treat them like they're not real when they are real. They do have a conscious mind. You're not hurting them physically. They can't feel anything, but you are still being, like, emotionally abusive towards them. Yeah, I... I- And it's one of those things where, like, in the context of the episode, you're like, yay, you know, Jesse Plemons is, like, stuck and he's probably going to die and all that kind of stuff. But, like, when you think about it, it's like, you know, getting outside of the context of the show, like, to really think about that whole thing, that's really messed up. They just killed somebody. Yeah, but, yeah, they did. But that is, like, such a weird topic to talk about because right now we're dealing with a small, brutal epidemic of swatting that is now costing people their lives. Yeah, that's just on the news this this weekend. Like, it happened yesterday. Yeah. So, like, this is, again, Black Mirror kind of like, oh, shit, we predicted the real life. Whoops. Um... Because if you're unaware, there is there is a practice online of doxing, where if you don't like a public figure and you manage to get a hold of their private information, you release their private information for the world to see. You release their phone numbers, their address, where they work, so that way then people can harass them. It's super fucked up. Don't fucking do it. Don't support anybody who does it. We can't have that shit going on. No. Some people take it a step further, and if they know somebody's phone number or where they live, they will call for emergency services to send a SWAT team on somebody they don't like. And this has been happening a lot in gaming communities with live streamers, um, where, you know, they call their local authorities or they call non-emergency authority and say shots have been fired. You know, some variation. Oh, this person has hostages, something like that. And... A SWAT team has to respond to that. The police have to respond to shots are fired. Fuck. We have to respond. We have to mobilize. And it's terrifying for the people who survive. But this week, there was a feud going on between two gamers on Twitter. And one of them tried to SWAT the other. But that person gave the first person a fake address. Like, not their address, but it was a real address. And then a SWAT team arrived at this random person's house and killed this kid, who was a father of two, who was not related to this at all, didn't play games, was not related to the feud at all. It was literally just a random thing. And that's on both of those people, as far as I'm concerned. The person who provided the fake address and the person who called in the SWAT. That is completely unacceptable. It should be legally unacceptable for both of them, but especially socially, no. We cannot condone this shit. This is the kind of stuff that absolutely needs to be called out. But you can't say that that's indicative of gamers as a full community. Yeah, it's definitely straw manning the issue. Um, You know, and while there are gamers that exist in the world that are like what um, female game critic Anita Sarkeesian and um, Zoe Quinn uh, game developer and uh, Brianna Wu um, another game developer um, okay I don't think it's fair to put Brianna Wu and Zoe Quinn in the same boat well, Brianna that Wu are, did that at are, least create one game right um, <laughs> but you know the the common names that uh, that are called out, um, you know, when addressing this issue, these are the names that usually come up. Uh, you know, Arthur Chu gets, but you know, he was a Jeopardy person that you know just kind of got tied into this whole um, 
wave. And, you know, during during this whole time, you know, uh, it was during um, during this time, the whole social justice warrior movement started around the same time, you know, at least coined that way. Um, and I can see that some people would watch this episode and, you know, start to start to backlash against it. But and, you know, rightfully so. I think that there are a lot of issues about this episode. Um, I, I think Black Mirror has usually been a lot more nuanced in its approach. And this did not feel like a nuanced episode. It felt like. Ghostbusters 2016, to a certain extent, while I really like the episode, I didn't like the message that was being put across because, uh, you know, we're going to get to a certain point where people are going to have to back off of, well, you can't call it sexist, but like, what is it then uh, of, you know, just vilifying, you know, men in general for no reason other than their gender and you know straw manning bad men uh and using that as a way to describe the potential for all men and i i I think that's really dangerous um it's dangerous for young boys growing up because uh, they are taught that their views and opinions are harmful and in these circumstances I think it's important to bring a dialogue Um, and this episode could have done that with some of the other characters but the fact that uh, Jesse Plemons character was the only character that was actually playing the game um, you know kind of took away from um the individualism of the other characters, you know, since they were essentially NPCs in um, yeah, this. Yeah, but I, I think that that worked for the message of the of the episode because that's all about the way he views them, but that's clearly not the way they view themselves. You know, even when he's not there, they still have their conscious mind. Right, but they're separate entities. They're not connected to the people at his office who he took the DNA from. Yeah, but from. they're also not connected to him. They're not connected to the program. Right. But he views them as just a part of his game and not as real people. And it, it does kind of fall in that like philosophical, I think, therefore I am sort of a thing of like, yes, they're not physically the same person that he's emulating them to be in the office but since they do have a conscious mind and they are emotional and they have memories and they can like control their own actions and their own fates and they can still respond to what he's saying regardless of his power that they are still their own conscious beings so what did you think of the episode uh what did you think its message was do you agree with us or did you see something else out of it uh leave your comments below or email us at all walks of film at gmail.com or go on to our facebook page thanks for listening <laughs>